You won't get in. It's encrypted. How is this possible? Cryptography systems are based on mathematical problems so complex they cannot be solved without a key. Somewhere out there, there's a bad guy who wants your information. In the digital age, one of the ways we protect our information is with encryption. Encryption uses mathematical functions to jumble up our data so badly that no one else can read it. Unless, of course, they have a secret key to unjumble it again. But that doesn't stop the bad guys from trying, so it's important to get it right. In this and the next two videos, we'll get an overview of how encryption works and why it's important to us. We talk about encryption and the digital age, but in truth, encryption is not new. Among the earliest known forms of encryption is the Caesar cipher. This was used by Julius Caesar when communicating with his generals. Take this simple phrase that might be sent to a general. This is easily readable and is called the plain text. To encrypt this information, we take each letter and we shift it along a certain number of positions. Caesar apparently shifted his alphabet by three, so we'll do the same. We then take each letter from the plain text phrase and substitute it with a shifted letter. So P becomes S, R becomes U, E becomes H, and so on each time we're shifting by three letters. The result is a jumbled up, unreadable sentence. This is called the ciphertext. Once the general receives his encrypted message, he will need to decrypt it. This is a simple case of reversing the process. But for this to work, the general needs to know how many letters to shift by. If he were to shift by anything other than three, he won't be able to decode the original message. So for us, the number three is our encryption key. We use this number to encrypt the message and we use it again to decrypt the message. If we want, we can use some other number as our key. This is like our password. It's critical that it is kept secret because anyone who has this key or password can decrypt our messages. The Caesar cipher is a type of encryption called a substitution cipher. This is because we're simply substituting one letter for another letter. The problem with the Caesar cipher is that it's easily broken, especially by today's standards. It's so easily broken as there is only one way to encode each letter. In the example we used earlier, an E will always encode to an H. This was the whole plot point of a Sherlock Holmes story, in which Holmes was able to break a substitution cipher by working out which symbols are more common substituting letters in, and seeing if they were to make sense. And once you've worked out a few letters, the rest is like playing Wheel of Fortune and guessing the rest. Also, as there are only 26 letters in the alphabet, we can only have 25 possible different keys. It's not hard to just try each one of them and to see what happens. We call this a brute force attack. I've put a few interesting links in the description so you can read more about this if you're interested. Fast forward to the early 20th century and encryption is still being used in warfare. However, it's now a lot more complicated. This is the Enigma machine. It was used by German forces during World War II to make their communications unreadable by enemy forces. It looked and acts a lot like an old typewriter. The operator would type in their plain text and lamps would light up showing the ciphertext letters. This is still a substitution cipher. That is, it replaces one letter for another letter. But it's much more advanced than the old Caesar cipher, as one letter won't encode to the same encrypted letter every single time. For example, pressing the A key may encode to the letter Q. Press A again, and now it might be an S. Every time a key is pressed, the encoding changes. Each Enigma machine has a variety of settings. On the front is a plug board that can be rewired into different configurations. Inside are rotors that turn whenever a key is pressed. This is how encoding changes for every key press. There are different rotors that can be used and they can be set up in different orders. This combination of settings forms the key. If you know which settings we use to encrypt a message, you could set up the machine accordingly 
and then decrypt the message. For a long time, this was considered to be an unbreakable code. There were so many different key combinations that it would take a mathematician several lifetimes to brute force a message. In addition to this, the keys would change every day. Many people were working to break the code. Eventually, English mathematician Alan Turing and his team found some success. Turing built a machine called the BOM, an ancestor of modern computers, which was designed specifically to break encryption. It would quickly try different key combinations and reject the ones that are obviously wrong. This would result in a few likely settings, which someone could then work out by hand. This was made easier when they found that the operators were using very specific phrases in their encrypted messages. They would always start with a weather report and always sign off the same way at the end. If you have some ciphertext, as well as some plain text that goes with it, it's much easier for someone smart enough to find the relationship between the two. These days, we encrypt all sorts of things, not just text messages. This happens all the time and you may not even know it. Think of your web browser when you're visiting a secure site, perhaps online banking. It has a padlock symbol, meaning that the connection to the web server is secure. Your web browser is using encryption algorithms and protocols to jumble up the data you're sending and receiving. And yes, they're a lot more advanced than the old substitution ciphers. And that's just the start. We can use encryption to keep transmitted information or information stored on a hard drive private. But the creative ways to use encryption doesn't end there. A message doesn't always need to be a secret, but we often need to confirm that no one has tampered with it. Encryption can provide us with a way to verify a message's integrity. And when you're online, who are you communicating with? How do you know the person or server you're communicating with is in fact genuine? Encryption can help us here too, playing a part in authentication. And no one can ignore the comparatively recent explosion in cryptocurrency. Yes, you guessed it, that uses cryptographic principles too. But what actually makes all of this possible? Essentially, it is very large, complicated numbers and math. The idea is that it's easy to compute these complicated numbers, and therefore create keys, but it's very difficult to reverse the process. Think of this simple example. Take 11 and 13, both of which are prime numbers, and multiply them. That's not hard, right? You just grab a calculator out and you type these numbers in, and you get 143. But what if I had have asked you to do the reverse instead? What if I asked you to tell me which two prime numbers multiply together to make 143? Not so easy now, is it? And remember that numbers in cryptography are massive. While a computer could eventually brute force this, it would take multiple lifetimes to do so. And by this time, whatever they're trying to break is probably irrelevant anyway. And that is what makes encryption possible by making something so hard that it can't be figured out in your lifetime. So if you're an IT professional, or you're just someone who's just plain interested, you will probably want to know how these modern forms of encryption work in the real world. So we're going to take a look into this in a bit more detail in the next two videos. So I hope you'll join me there.